All right, let's get started with Chapter 32, The Great Depression and the New Deal, 1933 to 1939. Let's start with the election of 1932. Republicans, uh, they meet and they're going to nominate Herbert Hoover to uh, run again. The platform for the Republicans would be to emphasize some of the anti-depression policies that they've tried to carry out over the last couple of years. Uh, and, and a kind of a half-hearted repeal of prohibition. Democrats, on the other hand, go with a kind of a new up-and-comer, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, where their platform really focuses on a repeal of prohibition, and at the same time, kind of a kind of attacking Hoover and uh, blaming him for the depression. Uh, they talk about trying to balance the budget, but also. Uh, creating some social and economic reform. Uh, there's the, uh, the New Yorker. Uh, Roosevelt obviously wins uh, quite handedly. Uh, obviously, economic uh, pain is, really will show at the polls. Uh, you also, at this election, 1932, you see the change uh, of black uh, blacks voting now for Democrats instead of Republicans. And so you see that real shift away from the party of Lincoln. The New Deal. This is, this is uh, kind of uh, Roosevelt's pledge uh, for the forgotten man. Uh, the forgotten man, of course, is all of those people who are out of work, uh, have no job, have have probably lost their home, have no, no real savings or anything like that. So what does he do? Uh, he really kind of calls for a banking holiday, March 6th through the 10th, 1933, in an effort to really um, kind of strengthen and investigate the, the banks that are open uh, to pretty much determine whether or not they should stay open <clears throat> or whether they should just uh, fold. Uh, that 100 days Congress, we'll talk about that in maybe a little bit more, but uh, really a uh, time period where uh, Congress and Roosevelt really pass a lot of the essentials of the New Deal. A lot of that New Deal policy really focuses on what's called the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Uh, one of the highlights of, of Roosevelt's uh, um, administration and his presidency that really brought about tremendous popularity for him were his fireside chats, of course. <clears throat> All right, regarding banking, that banking holiday, one of the pieces of legislation that they'll pass will be the Emergency Banking Relief Act of 1933. Uh, gave the president power to regulate banking transactions and foreign exchange and to reopen solvent banks. Uh, the idea behind solvent banks, that was one of the reasons they went had that holiday, was Roosevelt wanted people to know that once these banks were opened, you, it was safer now to keep money in these reopened banks instead of kind of hiding it under a mattress or something like that. Uh, people really lost faith in banks uh, with this with this depression. <clears throat> um, also, part of this uh, banking reform, you're going to get the passage of the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act. Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act really provided for the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and it's here uh, where the government. Uh, promise to insure your deposits, your individual deposit, up to $5,000. And of course, that would rise uh, much uh, down the road. Um, also created a commission called the Securities Exchange Commission in 1934 as a watchdog agency uh, to protect uh, the average person against, uh, really against Wall Street. How does he deal with unemployment? Uh, a lot of the New Deal programs, uh, and these are it's sometimes referred to as the alphabet soup of the New Deal, uh, they're going to come out with a lot of these programs to try to get, and they're gonna pump out billions of dollars 
Uh, this is government money to, to try to get people back to work. One of them, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, provided unemployment, fresh air government camps, um, where they got to keep some of their money, but uh, the rest had to be sent home to help their families. Uh, the FERA Federal Emergency Relief Act, about $3 billion that's given to the states uh, to simply pay for wages on, on specific work projects. Uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, AAA, millions of dollars to help farmers meet their mortgage. And of course, uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, this, this one tried to help the rest of the people, not just farmers, but other people to try to hold on to their, onto their homes. Uh, and here we get a whole list of, of these, the Civil Works Administration, the Works Progress Administration, um, the Public Works Administration. Uh, this one really focused on some of the long range recovery, uh, specifically looking at the Grand Coulee Dam. You have the picture there on your right. Um, huge, huge, in fact, I think it's one of the largest in the world. I think you can even see it from outer space. Um, but it not only the building of it, but it would have to be maintained. And so it, that was the idea behind long range. In regards to, to uh, industry and labor, uh, you're gonna get one of probably the most popular of, of all time, and that would be the National Recovery Administration, the NRA. Uh, pretty much those, that little uh, picture you have on the right there was um, pretty common in a lot of homes. In other words, people really got behind us and supported this. Uh, but it was the most complex scheme, combined immediate relief with long range recovery and reform, uh, designed to assist all three industry, labor, and the unemployed. All right, individual industries, uh, literally, they were going to work out codes of fair competition. Uh, for example, deciding uh, which hours of labor that would be reduced so that employment could be spread out over more people. Um, labor was granted uh, additional benefits. Uh, for instance, they were guaranteed the right to organize or bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, not the companies. Um, it will eventually be shot down by the Supreme Court in uh, the famed Schechter or Sick Chicken decision. Um, Congress, uh, justices unanimously held that Congress could not delegate legislative powers to the executive. Um, again, the Blue Eagle was extremely popular during this time period. And uh, you're going to see uh, a National Football League team that starts during this time that will also kind of utilize the Eagle and probably as a result of this, the popularity of the NRA. All right, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. Uh, the idea behind this was to um, establish parity pricing for basic commodities. Parity was the price set for a product that gave it the same real value or in purchasing power that it had enjoyed during the period from 1909 to 1914, uh, when um, the price on food crops was extremely high during that time. Uh, it literally would try to eliminate price depressing surpluses by paying growers to reduce, um, to reduce their, their uh, crop acreage. Uh, page 754 talks about the wobbly start um, it, it kind of got passed after a lot of these fields have been planted. So they kind of had to go back and, and just plow through, plow it all under again. Uh, even the idea of uh, it, it also got passed after a lot of like pig farmers, uh, they had, you know, their pigs had, had given birth to, you know, little piglets. And, and so they were supposed to reduce this. And so they ended up killing all these little pigs. And of course, during a time when, a lot of people were wondering where their next meal was coming from. This seemed like a huge waste. Uh, the Supreme Court does kill it in 1936. Uh, the idea being a, this regular, there was a regulatory taxation provision in there and they saw that as being unconstitutional. Uh, Soil Conservation Domestic Allotment Act of 1936. 
again, paid farmers to plant soil conserving crops such as soybeans uh, or just let that land lay fallow for a while. Uh, they will eventually, in 1938, they come out with a new Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938, uh, which did continue those conservation payments and um, gave farmers uh, kind of a fair price, but uh, at least a more substantial share of kind of the national income. All right, the Dust Bowl. Uh, late 1933, uh, really a big part of this was a drought in the really the prairie areas of the country, the middle of the country. Uh, map on 756 kind of gives you an idea where it was the worst and kind of where it spread. And you can see that kind of Route 66 kind of cuts right through that. But uh, part of the big the problem here is, is that you had, you know, from 1904 on, you had this increased cultivation of land. You know, farmers, you know, the, there, there was such a demand for American farm products that, that they just kind of rip through a lot of the prairie and, and create more, you know, more, more um, uh, planted, more crops. And um, these, the, the techniques and the mechanization uh, really kind of played a big role in this. Uh, dry farming ideas, you just kind of tore this, these prairie grasses down and, and plowed through that and plowed it all under. Uh, and they, they, they were able to because of Things like the tractor and uh, you know plow that they they were able to just just thousands of acres that now just laid open and then you have this drought and you've got nothing there to stop these winds and so these winds are going to pick up this topsoil and it's going to take it all over the place and the pictures that you have here uh, on this slide kind of give you an idea of how daunting this must have been uh, that one not I mean. Yeah, you had to you had to put masks on. You you had to protect yourself from breathing in all that dust. The Fraser Lemke Farm Bankruptcy Act of 1934 was an kind of an effort to try to help these farmers because they're obviously their farms are pretty much done, um, and they want to help save that by kind of suspending those mortgage payments for five years so that they could at least you know over time kind of make that back up and then get started again. But the Supreme Court. Uh, will will not uh, keep that going. Uh, resettlement administration, 1935. Uh, they move a lot of these farm near farmless farmers to some better lands that they could start, you know, producing there. Uh, again, probably something to kind of keep in mind too is that um, the story of the Dust Bowl is realistically portrayed in John Steinbeck's novel. The Grapes of Wrath in 1939. And you see uh, a massive um, exodus of farmers out of states like Arkansas and Oklahoma. And so you got these Arkies and Okies that pack up everything they have and they, they headed to California. And California actually got kind of tired of that and actually had signs telling them to, you know, go home. All right, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Tennessee Valley Authority was a massive, a massive project that really focused at, it really focused at um, recovery, long-term recovery here. Uh, it, it won, it's, it's gonna create just thousands, if not tens of thousands of jobs uh, that uh, will create electric power. And again, th this was going to be, the, the government was going to step in here and, and uh, really kind of look at how much this electricity really costs people. Because really, in, at the time, this is all kind of in the hands of, of private, private individuals. And they could charge what they wanted. And you're looking at an area of the country um, and that's on page 757, uh, but mostly Tennessee, but you got part of Mississippi and, and Kentucky and uh, Alabama and, and the like in there too. Um, and, and this was an area of the country that literally yet had electricity. It didn't have electricity yet. And so this was gonna dam up a lot of these rivers that were there that usually caused so much erosion that farming there was even ridiculous too. 
And so the picture that you have on the right there is one of these dams that are being built. You can see what a massive project that is. Uh, so you can see how it would create jobs. Um, eventually the power, um, it would provide that irrigation for farming and eliminate a lot of that erosion. And so this ends up becoming some of the, you know, the, the choicest land in America uh, as a result of this, this massive recovery effort. Uh, again, a slow down erosion and, and obviously the, the dams there for flood control. Uh, the success of the Tennessee Valley uh, prompted similar projects along the Columbia, Colorado, and Missouri rivers as well. Uh, but there's a pushback against the Tennessee Valley Authority too, because a lot of people kind of thought this was the government becoming so big and so controlling that this was a, this was a, a hint of socialism. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind here too. All right, other important acts, uh, the Federal Housing Administration uh, in an effort, FHA, in an effort to kind of speed recovery uh, of the building and um, building industry, housing industry, uh, they passed this this uh, this legislation, offering small loans to households, um, offering small loans to households uh, to try to improve or complete a new home. Uh, Social Security Act, uh, probably one of the greatest victories uh, for Roosevelt was the Social Security Act of 1935, but conservatives really fight this as a massive. Uh, socialistic uh, in, endeavor here. And so this this gets kind of some pushback, uh, but at the same time, it, it was a way to kind of help uh, and immediately the, the elderly. Um, so retired, um, retired workers of qualifying ages received regular payments from the federal government. Uh, it really was federal state unemployment insurance uh, really providing security again for, for old age. And uh, it's financed by your payroll tax on both the employer and the employee. So you're, who you work for and yourself, you're putting money into this, um, this fund. The Wagner Act, um, kind of the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, also known as the Wagner Act, uh, really kind of took the place of the NRA uh, creating a new National Labor Board um, Relations Board and, and also allowed labor to kind of self-organize and bargain collectively with their own reps. Um, one of the guys that uh, kind of um, uh, pushes a drive here, especially for unskilled worker, is a guy by the name of John Lewis. He'd be uh, eventually forming the CIO, the Committee for Industrial Organization. Uh, the Fair Labor Standard Act of 1938, uh, really even a better deal for labor uh, because it, it focused on companies that dealt with interstate uh, commerce uh, were forced now to establish one, a minimum wage, and secondly, a maximum hour, um, in other words, how many hours you, you could work. Uh, also, uh, in a, this, this would help especially unskilled workers. Labor under 16 was now forbidden. So that gets some pushback too, especially in the South. Some of those textile industries uh, really kind of relied on um, low wage labor uh, and even labor under the age of 16. So that takes us to the old election of 1936. Is the depression over? No. Uh, the Republicans are going to run a guy by the name of Alfred M. Landon and the Democrats, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, landslide victory for Roosevelt. And um, kind of an interesting quote, I think, is kind of what's going on uh, around you know the country, how everybody feels about Roosevelt anyway and his New Deal. Uh, governor of New York, the former governor of New York, actually ran for president um, a while back, uh, made this comment, no one shoots at Santa Claus. Um, and how, how true, you know, they, they kind of, he's referring to Roosevelt being Santa Claus and all the government handouts there. Um, again, a, a big appeal to the forgotten man. That That's what he was pushing. All these different programs were trying to help get all those people um, back to work. 
it, it does slightly work a little bit, but it never really, uh, eventually there's going to be another recession. It's going to hit again, uh, and then it, it'll fall back to about 25% of all people would be um, out of work. But the 20th Amendment goes into effect here. Uh, the 20th Amendment uh, took away that lame duck session of Congress, uh, which meant that uh, presidents would now uh, be inaugurated in January instead of March. All right, the Supreme Court issues. All right, this is going to be one of the, probably one of the things that really shocks the country and does the most damage to Roosevelt's reputation. Uh, first of all, the court was extremely conservative. Um, one of the uh, the ideas behind this was that uh, they kind of felt they needed to hang on uh, to kind of curb the socialistic tendencies of the very, what they considered a radical White House. Uh, what they did, they rejected seven of seven of nine, seven of the nine uh, New Deal propositions that Roosevelt had, and of course Roosevelt, not liking that, uh, kind of develops an idea how to get around that. Um, keep in mind that, that uh, six of uh, six of the nine justices were seventy years or older. All right, so they were getting up there in age. And so Roosevelt kind of attacks their age a little bit here. And so he comes up with this scheme to add six more justices. And the idea behind six more justices was that it was, he would add a new justice for every member that was over 70 and would not retire, which would give him a total of 15 justices then. Um, Roosevelt's going to be vilified here for attempting to break down that delicate checks and balance among the three branches of government and uh, kind of accusing him of kind of grooming himself as a dictator here. Um, it really takes the public and Congress by surprise and he's he's gonna he's gonna finally um, get kind of stopped in his tracks here and and uh, this Congress is going to kind of put a halt to this. Uh, his popularity does suffer uh, with not only accusations of dishonesty, but uh, even more the idea that he was becoming kind of a, a, uh, a dictator. Some notable New Deal names here. There are three of them. Uh, and it's not that they're necessarily for the New Deal. These are guys that actually speak against the New Deal. And one is uh, Father Charles Coffin, a Roman Catholic priest who had a very popular radio show uh, where he broadcast his anti-New Deal social justice um, slogans. Uh, another is this guy. And this guy was probably one of the more dangerous ones, Senator Huey Long. Uh, he was interestingly very anti-New Deal, uh, but also a strong socialist with the idea of we need to share our wealth program. Uh, he'll eventually be assassinated. And then there's this guy, Dr. Francis Townsend, uh, who developed some early social security ideas. He, he was kind of a wealthy doctor. Um, he uh, was, I think, about to retire or had retired, but the crash pretty much kind of went from uh, riches to rags kind of story. Uh, and so he kind of developed some of the early Social Security ideas. There's Dr. Townsend. Uh, you also get the um, Committee on Industrial Organization. That's the CIO with, with John Lewis. We talked about that before. He was the founder and really a union uh, for unskilled workers. And we had talked about that before uh, with the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, where they uh, opened up the door for uh, unskilled workers to kind of organize themselves into effective unions. And, and that uh, is the foundation of the, the CIO. All right. Keynesianism, uh, new economic orthodoxy. Here's what happens. 1937, the economy takes another sharp downturn. Uh, you've got this severe depression within the depression, uh, which was sometimes referred to as the Roosevelt recession. Uh, certain um, 
reasons for this was probably uh, you had Social Security taxes uh, biting into payrolls, and then the administration making some cuts on spending uh, to try to balance the budget. Um, it's at this point that uh, FDR now embraces the economic theories of John Keynes. Um, this, the whole kind of, in a nutshell, uh, Keynesianism is stimulating the economy with planned deficit spending. This really marks a, a turning point in the government's relation to the economy. Uh, it was going to be, the government was now going to um, use this spending to kind of prime the pump of the economy and encourage consumer spending. Uh, this really becomes kind of the economic philosophy of the United States for, for decades. So where does, where does FDR stand here? FDR really um, a lot of bold reform, uh, no revolution. He gets, he's constantly kind of ripped on be, be, turning our nation into a socialist country with, with all the New Deal programs. Um, but, but really, he, he probably more than anything kept us from kind of crossing over that line like so many other countries in Europe are doing so at this time. So that wraps up uh, this chapter and uh, we'll get back to you on chapter 33.